will be the first to go. Thereafter, we are going to have David. And lastly, we are going to have Nicholas Vetting. Moses Ikera is a gentleman who is an alumni of the University of Nairobi. So is David and everyone. And they are going to join this exciting pursuing rewarding careers. It's a new normal. So David, I hope you'll be sharing what is this rewarding careers in this new normal. I don't know whether Moses has managed to join now. I'm looking for him. Let me give him a few minutes, then uh, we get cracking. Morning, Fred. You are muted. You are muted. You are mute. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. At long last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's called the new I, normal. Huh? <laughs> yeah. You know, you know. You said you sent the link, so I was waiting, and I just said, "Hey, what's up?" <laughs> yeah. I thank you for joining. I think Moses is with us. Uh, David. Uh, David is your other co-presenter. Osula, mm. you can see him. David, please wave to people. David, yeah, D David is there. Yes. And uh, John Orindi has joined us, our corporate affairs director. Yeah. John, can you wave to people, please? Thank you, thank you. I can see we have quite lots of people are joining us, and uh, it's exciting. Uh, we have a gentleman called Nick Waite. Mm -hmm. Nick, thank you very much for joining us. We have Edwin Corre joining us. Thank you very much. Marilyn, please feel welcome. We have, uh, yes, and every one of us, uh, Tito Masara, please feel welcome. Kevin Oranga, please feel welcome. Please feel welcome. And uh, we will we'll be starting in a very short while. We, we, we are now nice quorum. We are 10 minutes into the hour and uh, it's my belief that we can get started. On behalf of University of Nairobi Management, the staff and students are well, would like to welcome all of you to the 10th University of Nairobi Open Day. This one, because of the new normal, is a virtual one. And you have joined from wherever you are, and you have joined us to hear the career talk. The first webinar we are having is on pursuing rewarding careers. COVID-19 has brought us new beginning. COVID-19 has brought with it a silver lining. Since March, 2020 in this country, new opportunities have come about and new opportunities are going to come. Normally of open day in the old normal post pre-COVID will be in great court with Moses, David and Nicholas sitting in Taifa Hall to give this talk. And thanks to the new normal, the COVID-19, Moses now is in his office. 
David is in office. Nicholas, who is joining us soon, is in the office. And all of us are wherever. And it's exciting. To the students, our stakeholders who are listening, this new uncertainty is having exciting opportunities. How do we explore them? We are working now, as I'm doing now, from my house. And this, we know, is going to be the new normal. Big organizations like IBM are pronouncing themselves Microsoft that maybe in the future, nobody will be going to the physical brick and mortar offices. Our mom and boga in the village where I come from should be able to have value addition for her Skuma Wiki and sell to those colleagues who are joining us from Australia. So is the young man who is in my local trading center with his innovations, his drawings, should be able to explore this new normal. Without much ado, with that short introduction, I'd like to welcome our panelists today. We have Dr. Moses Ikiara. And Moses, kindly just introduce yourself and tell the audience, the, your organization, briefly, so that they get to know you're from industry and you're an alumni of University of Nairobi. Moses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, and good morning also, David, um, uh, and the, uh, the, the colleagues who are, who are listening, participating in this webinar. Yeah, um, my name is Dr. Moses Ikeda, as you've heard from Fred. I am an alumni of the uh, University of Nairobi. I did both a um, Bachelor of Science in Agriculture at CAVS, a College of uh, Agriculture and Events uh, um, uh, Studies. I left in 19, uh, 1990, so I was there in 1987 up to 1990, 19, yeah, up to 1990, the, the double intake. I think many of you know the, the challenge we had when two, two groups went to, uh, to came to campus together. Uh, I, I did BSc agriculture, finished, then I went to, actually I was the first uh, person, I think uh, from what I know, who moved from uh, BSc agriculture to do MA economics. So I went to main campus and did a master's uh, uh, in economics. Uh, and uh, then later on, uh, went to University of Amsterdam where I did uh, a PhD in economics, but specializing in environmental uh, in environmental economics. So I mean, head of, um, you know, I, I like agriculture very much. I have that uh, background. I'm an, I'm an economist. Um, and I also lead a specialist in environmental issues. So I like sustainability, you know, and keeping things green. Um, it's, been, it's been exciting. Uh, in terms of work, I worked briefly as a lecturer at Moon University, School of Environmental Studies. I left in the year 2000 uh, and then joined uh, Kenya's biggest uh, public think tank. It's called uh, KIPRA, Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, in July of 2000. I worked there 12 years, and the last six and a half years, I was a uh, executive director. Uh, we did exciting work on things like uh, economic recovery strategy that was able to accelerate um, growth of our economy from 0 0.2, 0 0.5% in 2002 to actually 7.1% in, uh, you know. You are mute, you are mute, Fred. Thank you, Moses. Thank you for that I, brief well, introduction. Were you, were you stopping me or you are talking to somebody else? <laughs> I was talking to somebody else, so yeah, just so let, continue. Let me, let me take a few seconds to finish. 
Okay. So I was in Kipra for that time. I left in 2012. I joined the Kenya Investment Authority uh, or Kenya Invest, where we tried to attract private investment into our country. Uh, and I've served there eight years. Actually, last week was my my head of a second contract. Uh, so now I'm just uh, actually looking forward to uh, creating jobs and doing more more exciting uh, uh, exciting things. Thank you very much, friend. Thank you, thank you, Moses. You can hear it. Uh, alumni, very diverse background. And the person will actually tell us, who, who are, what are these ex- uh, rewarding careers? David, David, can you kindly introduce yourself so that you tell everyone uh, uh, w- 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 where you're coming from and your background and uh, later on you'll share with us uh, your experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Fred. Uh, thank you, Bonasio. Moses, good to hear from you. I'm David uh, Osula. I'm currently the corporate uh, manager for Qatar Airways in Nairobi. I'm also an alumni of the University of Nairobi, though I studied from Kenyatta University. Uh, back in the days when uh, the good professor Ishiwani was our VC there. So I did my BCom at uh, Kenyatta University. After completion, I entered into airline industry, that is uh, Kenya Airways. Uh, Then I started pursuing my MBA at uh, Nairobi University. Currently, I've also enrolled for a leadership course. So I find it very interesting. I've been in uh, airline industry. I've been in other corporates in uh, media. Uh, which includes KBC, Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, uh, Royal Media Services. And right now um, I've joined Qatar Airways as a corporate manager and um, it's quite exciting. Uh, University of Nairobi is one of our partners uh, with the airline. We are supporting students in, uh, in a lot of things. And it's, it's uh, good to know that there are a lot of people who are doing good and great job and alumni of uh, University of Nairobi doing, uh, contributing to uh, the, the good uh, economy and uh, welfare of, of, of Kenya. So it's an opportunity that we can have with the students, parents, and uh, the staff and members of the University of Nairobi to just explore these opportunities and to have um, uh, a good moment while at it. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. I don't know whether my other third co-host is around, uh, Dr. Nicholas Letting. Uh, I don't know whether you have joined us. Yes, yes, I've joined. Thank you. Ah, Nicholas, thank you very much. We need to see your face, Nicholas. Ah, lovely. <laughs> Please kindly introduce yourself to the, and then later on you'll have, uh, you'll have your, the, 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 the 15 minutes. <clears throat> thank you, friend, and good morning, everyone. My name is um, Dr. Nicholas Letting. Currently, I'm the Chief Executive Officer and the C and Secretary of CASNEF. CASNEF stands for Kenya Accountants and Secretaries National Examination Board. I have been CEO for the last two years. And uh, before that, I was Vice Chancellor at the Management University of Africa. Uh, I am at, I'm uh, addressing this meeting while in, in Mombasa for a workshop. And uh, I'm very glad to be part of this uh, meeting. So. As an, maybe to introduce, to introduce myself, I, I, I wish to say that I'm a, a triple alumni of the University of Nairobi. I, I, I had my, my PhD uh, from the University of Nairobi in the business administration, specializing in strategy management in 2011, and got my, my MBA in 20, 2004 in uh, strategic management, and my BCom uh, about 20 something years ago in the Bachelor of Commerce. School of Business now. I, I will say that I have also been, uh, I worked in various organizations. Um, I worked BAT immediately after my bachelor's degree. Um, I worked for eight years in BAT in, in, um, in finance, leave operations, and uh, in my resources. Then I worked with KIM, Kenya Institute of Management, between, for about five years before I moved to university, where I have raised through the ranks. I was apart from um, my, my academic qualifications, I was all the professional qualifications that are examined by CASNEP. Maybe that's why I'm now the CEO. I did CPA when I was in the university doing my BCom, and also I did sub- certified uh, public secretary, and later on I did certified investment and financial analyst. So to my 
to their host, the University of Nairobi, I'm very glad to be back home in our alma mater, and to the, uh, to the current group of students and, uh, and my fellow panelists, I really want to thank you for this session. I look forward to sharing our experiences on career choices. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Nicholas. I think now we know who is going to share this rewarding careers with us. To start us off, is going to be Dr. Moses. Uh, Juma, please allow him co-hosting right so that he can share his screen. So Moses, you have your 15 minutes. Thereafter, uh, David will take over. Moses. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Fred, uh, what I prepared was in the form of a speech. So uh, I don't know whether I should share the screen or not. Um, initially, actually, I thought uh, it may be a career day where we are almost uh, you know, seeing each other, but it's a new normal. <laughs> so, Moses, we um, have seen you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are seeing you. <laughs> yes. We are in this big hall. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, let me. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can, uh, where are we, where are we? Yeah, I think you can just talk if it doesn't, uh, if it's not here, you can just talk, yeah. Okay, well, okay. So, so then let me, I'll, I'll talk slowly so that at least uh, everybody can hear me. Um, so um, well, first, let me start by thanking uh, Fred, uh, Dr. Los Mikal, and all the other people who have put this uh, uh, webinar together, and for inviting me. I, I did a, anything I can do for my university. Uh, I feel proud uh, in, for any moment to, to participate in an event for, for this university that I'm very proud of. The subject of the webinar is also timely and exciting, especially for me because I was one of the first CAVS graduates uh, who are not automatically posted to a job. You know, previously, you, you, when you finish university, you knew you were posted to a job, uh, you don't go there, you don't change uh, if you needed to really uh, do something uh, different. But when you did the, the, this a double um, intake, when you graduated, we got a shock because there was no, uh, no such. So I was part of the double cohort, 1987 to 90, where I took BSc in agriculture. Uh, we both the groups that finished in A levels in 85 and 86 were the, 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 the ones that made the, 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 the double intake. Um, we have, I wanted to actually start off by saying, right now, we have a WhatsApp group that has survived more than, uh, more than 10 years uh, of, uh, we call it CAPS 90. Uh, because the people we finished that double intake, we have almost 200 uh, colleagues who are in the WhatsApp group. We have people from US, in China, they are in Australia, they are in Kenya, different parts of Kenya, East Africa. And people have gone to different careers. It's, uh, it's, very, it's very exciting. Uh, we debate contemporary issues, we share experiences, we support each other during a crisis such as death of our close family members. Uh, in fact, we've just uh, supported uh, uh, Professor Afulo, who lost his uh, dear wife uh, just recently. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving context because you know, careers or not, networks are very, very important. And um, uh, so we, we, we have this uh, interesting group. We have put and on transformative agendas. We ask ourselves, what can we do for agriculture in, in particular and for the Kenyan economy in general? Because we are the cream of society. The community has uh, sacrificed a lot to educate us. How can we transform? Every time we debate the challenges that we see, 
and we, we keep asking ourselves. We have tried uh, several things, like forming maybe a, a, an NGO that can do a, a number of things, giving problems, but we, but we are continuing. Um, on political issues, we've, almost, we've spread a number of times. Uh, because every time we discuss politics, uh, I think it's, the divisions are so wide, we forget uh, that we are professionals. And I think this is really a challenge for our country because uh, every time politics come, and I'm very, very unhappy to say this, I'm ashamed to say this, as professionals, we lose our professional uh, you know, uh, calling, and sometimes it just get sucked into the political divisions. It's something I hope that can be overcome. But we've survived all these years. So the points I'll be sharing today with you are actually not just my own. Uh, I, I posted to this group and said, ah, I'll be talking about uh, careers and rewarding careers. Do you have ideas? Uh, so, so I'm happy. I think uh, if you find it very nice, then you know I'm not taking credit alone. I'm, 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 my colleagues have contributed. If it doesn't measure up, I take responsibility because I'm the one speaking and I to put it uh, together. Uh, now, to the subject matter. So, first of all, I think I would like to say the and here I will now be, I will be talking about the core range of agriculture and event services because that's why I know very much. And uh, initially I thought I would be only addressing that constituency. Uh, that course, when we, when we were living um, in levels and to get into, into, the, into this uh, BSc agriculture, you need only about uh, eight, nine or so points yeah, in levels while engineering and others were more than, you know, way beyond 10. And we, we, we thought it was really not maybe the cream of the, of the, of the courses. But I want to say that um, having gone through it, there's no course that is as good as that. So first of all, congratulations to the students who have uh, qualified uh, to join uh, this college, or those who are in the progress, they are, they are, making, they are doing their studies. Uh, and the parents also who have invested, who are paying school fees, uh, I really uh, would like to reward them for uh, for accepting bringing their their, student, their, their children to this uh, college. Uh, why the course is this college is great? It uh, gives you a very wide range of skills um, that helps you to navigate life challenges. Uh, the courses. You move from, uh, we learn the, we learn the math, we learn the sciences, the basic sciences, we learn agriculture, we learn statistics, we learn law, a bit of law, we learn social sciences, including economics. We did, we, 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 we proud with tractors and did a couple of things. Uh, those who didn't know, learned how to, to milk and, you know, to milk using the technology. So it is, from where I sit, you could get a better courage because the exposure it gives you. And I'm saying this because later on, I'll make a point that uh, there's no career that can be rewarding. It just depends on uh, what you really have, uh, how you approach it. Um, so um, it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a courage where you, you work very hard. You sacrifice your free time, uh, but uh, the investment is worth it. When you later go out, you actually find it was worth it. So uh, the advice number one that we'd like to make, especially to students who are joining or looking to join or going on, is that uh, uh, you have to work hard. And this is uh, critical to the rewarding careers. You can't talk about rewarding careers if you don't work hard and lay down the, the, the foundation. So whether you are, whatever you study or whatever career you want, you have to work hard. You have to stand out. You have to really uh, come out as a, a key person uh, in, in your area. Uh, absorb all the knowledge. Uh, if you come out half bit, somebody will get, will get you a job first time. They will see the work is shorting 
and they will not come back to you again. Uh, you might get them for it somewhere sooner or later. They will be waiting for your contract to end so that they can they can uh, burn you off. So uh, in this discussion of rewarding careers, number one that we want to have to tell you with my 200 or so comrades is you have to work hard. There's nothing. Uh, call it work hard or smart. Both work both hard, work smart. Uh, you really have to to absorb. The, the key things from the, from the course. Our advice number two, the power to read and do all that pertains to the degree. You remember what, what we are told when you are graduating, those days when you are graduating and you are raring to go, you are given the, the power to read and do all that pertains to the degree. In fact, even our one of the previous vice chancellor, uh, Professor Gichanga, is on record one time saying, most of what you learn may not be useful, but get a bit of what is useful and run with it. So uh, what we mean, the what you study does not confine you to what you have read. I mean, you are not confined to what you have read. And I've been giving a few examples now of people who have gone out from where they started and they are shining, they are shining in the uh, in society. So you have to be flexible, think out of the box, be ready to grab the opportunities that, that arise even outside agriculture. And I like what a uh, friend started with. He said, this is a COVID time. This COVID time has shown us two things. Kikiumana kabisa, when things are really, really bad, what you need, the most critical thing is food. You need to get food, and we need medicine. It has been amazing how Kenyan society has responded. People uh, innovating these uh, contraptions where you, you can step on one panda to, to, to put a, 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 a soap and the other one um, uh, to, to, to give water, the ventilators. Uh, within the first two months after the, the crisis, there was, no, there was no shortage of uh, uh, sanitizers because uh, polytechnics and other people innovated, went to do sanitizers and to do masks. It has actually put Kenya, the, the innovativeness capacity uh, came to fall. So um, you really have to be ready to grab opportunities uh, that arise. Um, Whatever you study does not uh, preclude you from desired and rewarding careers. So whichever college, you still can get your, your, your uh, careers. Let me mention a few people just to, to actually emphasize this point. I don't know if you, any of you know Honorable Ekwe Oduro. Ekwe Oduro was a CAVS graduate. Uh, I think he left maybe a year or two after before us. And uh, he was to become the speaker of the, of the Senate, you know? Uh, you don't, I don't know if you know the late Dr. Esron Nyangito. Dr. Esron Nyangito taught us. We worked with him also in Kipra a bit. He went on to become the PS for health, not agriculture, and he did a good job in health. And then after that, he became uh, also the deputy governor of the Central Bank. You know, what he studied? Uh, agriculture. Uh, then we have, uh, I think maybe many of you may know Dr. Bivi, who was uh, the CEO of uh, Fresh Produce Exporters Association. He started off with the Fish, uh, Fish Exporters Association. Uh, he finished that. He's now an advisor to the Namib Namibian president on uh, agricultural issues and others. Uh, and uh, after he left, he was replaced by another CAVS graduate. Uh, um, uh, Beth, Beth, uh, Beth. You also may know the current uh, Inspector General of Police, Hilary Mutiambai, was actually my classmate. So he, he started the agriculture, but look at what he is doing at the, at the moment. Uh, we have, uh, of course, there are those who have remained in the sector, like Professor Magius Dida. Uh, recently, he showed us in the WhatsApp group how he has come up with a very nice uh, uh, maize variety, which is highly productive and is, uh, is, looks very attractive in terms of many colors, 
you know. We have many CEOs who have come from CAFs, the head of a CAFIS, who was the, the one who, who left and the one who has just been appointed, went through CAFs, uh, uh, persons and the uh, test and control board also, the National Irrigation Board, the National Potato Council of Kenya, all those are being run by uh, people who went to, to Kabete. And I also said I've served in two institutions as CEO, finishing two of my terms. And we are talking about economic policy there, patient turned that and others, I participated in that. Uh, we have then uh, people who have become top notch consultants. Joe, Joe Bosumba is in our group, Bell O'Kell, Brian Barasa. We have tax experts. We have top stock experts like Sam Kalanja. We have people who have owned businesses. These are just the, the few I can cite top of my mind. And what am I telling you here is the power to lead and do what appertains does not confine you to one segment. You have to be ready to take opportunities. And to be ready is to absorb the knowledge, synthesize it, be on, on point with the technology, and, uh, and then uh, 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 be disparate as you do your work. Our advice number three is um, do what you enjoy and it will be rewarding. So Fred, I'm not going to, to say here, oh, being an actual scientist is a rewarding career, or being an economist, or being an accountant, or being a politician, uh, or being an entrepreneur. The secret is to do something you enjoy, something you love, something that every time you wake up in the morning, you are waiting for the, for the sun to rise so that you can get at it again. If you do something that you don't like because you think it's rewarding, there's good money, you'll be miserable. In economics, we measure, we don't look so much about money because money in itself is necessary but not sufficient. We measure what is called utils or utility, call it happiness. So money, if it doesn't give you happiness, it doesn't, it's really not important. Uh, so even career that you choose, you need to listen to yourself and say, this is what I love doing every day. And then I, then I, can, I can tell you for sure it will be rewarding. You can seek jobs, yes, by no means, but don't wait idly, waiting for the dream job. No, don't be daunted by capital. People say, I don't have capital. How can I do all this? And the challenges keep coming. Join up with your colleagues. I, I can tell you, for instance, I do a bit of farming uh, as a side hustle. And the most frustrating thing is to get a good vet. You know, who can, uh, I've lost many sheep and the uh, and Kenyan chicken and the other things because we have a lot of quacks in the market. I said, where did all the vets go to? I think it's, it seems like all the vets went to, to train um, the pets, the, 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 dog, the pets, uh, cats and dogs for musungus and those who are, who are right, because uh, there are a lot of people who can get good vets. So why can't uh, uh, professionals join up, work together, form strong corporate uh, ethos and the foundation, and be able to, uh, to really deal with these kind of challenges? Uh, be an entrepreneur and go into business and uh, join up, form partnerships. There are all people. If there's an area you are not, you feel you are not on the cutting edge of technology, share, uh, join up with a Chinese or a, or, a, or, a, or a Korean or an American or some or an, or an Indian. Uh, we find in my work in uh, investment, I've seen many people when they set, set up a company. They are so scared to, to invite partners because they think their company might, uh, might, might disappear. So they remain with a, maybe a 10 million company for a long time, where they have almost 100% of the 10 million. Yet, if they got a partner, it can become a 100 million company. And even if you have 50% of a 100 million of company, it is 50 million, uh, bigger than 10 million. So it's a, 
partnerships are important so that uh, you can complement each other uh, in, uh, in, 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 in skills. Forget those white collar jobs. I'm happy to see now young people are doing a lot of greenhouses. Uh, there's a time we were so worried about uh, youth and agriculture. The youth are not going to agriculture. They want white collar, they want high tech, they want ICT. Uh, but they are doing it uh, in their own style, uh, greenhouses, and, uh, uh, and they're doing a good job uh, starting to export. So please, we need to roll up our sleeves and take the opportunities, whatever comes. In, in, the, in our group of 200 or so, there are people who even started uh, uh, selling changa, you know, or, or, or opened a uh, small, mat we became matatu touts and all that to begin with. And they have navigated and, they, and they had gone far uh, out of that. So uh, let me then come to, as I go to one said, is to say um, with COVID, it has shown the areas to go to because food is essential. Whatever happens, people always have food. No wonder if you look at uh, multinationals, even companies like Pitico Africa. They are all going to food because uh, they, everybody has to eat. Population is growing, and as incomes are growing, we are now at a per capita income of uh, uh, we are per capita income of uh, uh, almost two thousand uh, dollars. And we come a long way because when Kibaki was taking over, it was just about less than six hundred. So we come a long way uh, with that growth in income uh, and the population you know people always want food. So I think we really need to, uh, to, to focus more on that. Uh, let me, as I think, I, I would say the most rewarding career in my own view has to be in agriculture. Call it uh, agripreneurs, if you wish. Because more than three quarters of our population relies on agriculture. The market is big and, uh, and it's growing even bigger. Uh, and the COVID has demonstrated, as I mentioned, how, how critical this is. We are, why are we relying on imported food increasingly? If you look at the many agricultural enterprises and the plot production over time, you see almost all enterprises uh, tapering off and starting to go down. Yet consumption is still going up. So we, are, we have a big uh, uh, gap that we need, uh, we need to, uh, to fill up. Um, so uh, we need to sort out, my own view is that we need to sort out agriculture nationally by focusing, we can say every year because of budget constraint, let's sort out one or two value chains uh, or two to three value chains every year. We say this year we are sorting out uh, uh, maybe uh, tea or coffee. You move all the problems, secure stronger markets, and deal with the input challenges, sibling quality issues, and you make sure that that is aligned and we are processing. You do the same to coffee, do sugar, do macadamia, avocado, the kind of opportunity that can, uh, can give us will be, uh, will, be, will, be, will be amazing. Me, myself, now because I finished my contract in government, uh, as I said last week, I'm so excited because I want to now go and uh, set up factories you know, to process agro produce. I'm so psyched because I, I want to see this thing happening and, uh, and uh, exporting. Now, my final thoughts on rewarding careers, I cannot think of a career that is not rewarding. I cannot think of a career that is not rewarding. What is critical is to think out of the box. Find your niche. Be the best in that space, whatever it takes. Be disciplined and always reflect on how you can improve even what is working very well. Don't wait for things to start going bad, so that you start improving. It is continuous improving, even when things are, are working well. Forge and keep strong networks and partnerships. Never give up and be like farmers, who always plans, even after an irritating failure. And like the famous hummingbird of the late Professor Wangari Madai, ignore doubting Thomas's who we'll just fold their hands and, uh, and you take every little step like the, the hummingbird towards the cannon. And the cannon that we are talking about is a, a rewarding career 
success, growth, and wealth, money in your pockets. And Babo, be led by the fear and wisdom of the Lord, think global, but act local. So thank you very much. I, I hope you have uh, captured what I said. I wish I could be able to, to share the screen, but uh, uh, this remark can be made available. Looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please let's, let us applaud Moses. Thank you, Moses. Thank you, Moses. I think Moses has said it. Do something that you enjoy. Do something that you enjoy. And I think that is more important. Secondly, Moses has told us agriculture is a rewarding career, especially during the COVID era. For those of us who live in Nairobi, we know the cars that lined the roads with farm produce, the potatoes, the mangoes, the, you name it, all of us became entrepreneurs. I think Moses stay, stay along. There'll be interactive panel at the end of all the presentation. And this juncture, I'd like to welcome David Osula to really share with us, which are these rewarding careers? David, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Fred, uh, Dr. Moses, uh, for this wonderful insight that you shared. Um, the same scenario is playing in uh, also aviation. And uh, I can tell you that the COVID-19 situation has taught us to be resilient uh, in all this, because the new ideas, the new innovations that have come in from this scenario for the last one year or so, has opened up our eyes into the approaches that you are using actually to, to be productive. Uh, education does not necessarily lead to employment. Uh, that school of thought is no longer uh, holding water. So even for the young guys in this generation who are actually pursuing the education, it is just a means towards achieving a lot of things in the future. It's not just a mean to employment. In fact, it is also a means to create employment. We should be employment creators, not uh, just uh, employment seekers. So very importantly, our career should be aimed at production. And production is not necessarily that you have to be employed to be productive. There are so many avenues that we can approach to be productive. So allow me just to take you uh, to the journey of aviation industry. Uh, at this moment, I'll share my slide. Mm, you're able to tell me if you're able to see it in a few moments. Yes, David, we can see your, your screen. Yes, yes, so there we are. Um, aviation industry, as you know, is very interesting. Uh, it's a very versatile industry, uh, I can tell you. And it's one of the industries that has survived the COVID-19 scenario. Uh, the losses that have happened for the last one year or so are huge, but we have not gone down. So that tells you that uh, we are among the critical services provider in, in the economy of the world. So uh, just to look at the figures, uh, just a moment, it's gone so fast. The industry in numbers, a vision industry actually has been increasing. The trend has been increasing since uh, 29, up to 2019. The numbers have been good. Uh, passenger revenue alone has been up to around 374 billion US dollars, uh, nearly doubled within a span of uh, a decade or so. But COVID-19 actually reduced that growth to nearly 50% down. So if you look at the passenger volume in 2019, that was uh, the revenue that has been accrued by the airline uh, aviation industry was $374 billion, sorry. It has reduced to around 50%. But nonetheless, you will find that the industry has not gone down completely. Uh, we might have grounded aircrafts, we might have closed some airports, we might have uh, banned some people to travel, which has caused inconvenience to many people, uh, corporate and uh, individuals alike but the industry has not gone down. The industry has recovered a little bit in uh, 2021. And still, in as much as a lot of people have lost their jobs, 
the industry is still remaining relevant. And as the industry recovers, actually some of the corporates that have been uh, have put people on hold or sent people to work from home or even uh, employees that are being paid uh, half salary, there is opportunity for them to be absorbed back, which I find is a good policy. And many corporates have actually approved this policy, which is a humane approach because the disease is not the doing of anyone. It is not the employees who brought the disease. It is uh, an issue that is affecting the, the worldwide uh, families, corporates, industries, entrepreneurs alike. So there's an opportunity to absorb back those who have lost their jobs once the industry starts recovering. And as uh, having said that, I just want to tell you that aviation industry impacts on a lot of other industries because actually people travel to do business. People carry goods, move goods and services from one place to another. People consult uh, from one country or another. Political integration has been brought because of access of airspace. So aviation plays a very critical role in the economies of the world. If you look at the aviation jobs, the direct jobs that have, have been uh, employed in the aviation industry is 11.3 million active uh, people. We have airport operators going to around 1 million. We have other airport-based roles, 5.5 million. Retail, car rental, customs, immigration, freight, forwarding, catering, hospitality, and all others that are supporting the aviation industry. We look at airlines have employed more than 3.6 million people in uh, flights, operations, executives, ground services, training, maintenance, and all this. Civil aviation space plays a very critical role in uh, oversight, regulation, monitoring, and, and uh, quality, quality control. And uh, civil aerospace pol plays a very critical role, even in politics. You might find that one country has an issue with another. Uh, travel restrictions uh, also affect the economy and political landscape of countries. We have uh, other sectors like air navigation, space explorations. In the current technology, there's a company being run by Elon Musk, uh, this fella who is a big investor, multi-billion investor. They're exploring, exploring uh, opportunities to go to Mars and into space. Someone like Richard Branson has invested billion of pounds to do space exploration. So aviation industries encompasses a lot of technology, a lot of investment, a lot of human capital. So it's a, it's a very interesting industry to, to pursue. And it integrates other supporting industries like aviation industry supports more than 18.1 million indirect jobs. And these jobs touch on other industries like oil and gas, construction, suppliers of components and materials, manufacturers of goods and services. Even recently during Valentine's, our farmers here benefited from uh, exporting flowers uh, to Europe and, and other parts of the world through aviation. Because you get your flowers today, tomorrow in the morning, the flowers are in the hands of a consumer in Amsterdam or in, in, in Australia and so forth. So aviation actually uh, facilitates the growth of other businesses that supports the roles therein. Information and technology, safety, humanitarian uh, uh, in the, uh, organizations who are like right now, the manufacturers of the COVID-19 vaccine are actually relying on aviation to make these vaccines available uh, to various citizens of the global community and even disaster management is being supported by aviation industry. So as we continue to pursue this, you'll find that even uh, what, what you're calling induced jobs are jobs that are indirectly being supported by aviation industry or the aviation industries need uh, these, these uh, skills uh, and, and other things that are being supported by the, the communities in these sectors. We have uh, aviation industry supports more than 44 million uh, jobs in tourism. Tourism in Kenya is a very big contributor to the GDP. And the industry and employment uh, by tourism industry has been affected the last two years. Remember the hotels have closed down or scaled down operations, uh, tourism, people visiting in and out of the country. But then again, you realize that aviation is a very core component of the tourism industry because actually visitors come in through 
uh, air travel and, and related activities. But then again, as I said, we are also experiencing growth since uh, the airspace was opened in August last year. Tourism has, has continued to grow significantly, even though it is not as good as compared to last year, same time, but you'll find that after aviation and airspace were opened in many countries, tourism has picked up. And this uh, shows that aviation industry is, is a very key player uh, in, in uh, economic landscape for the country, especially in Kenya, where we rely on tourism as a source of uh, income to many people, source of employment to many people. And tourism supports even institutions of learning where you find that international students are also coming like to the University of Nairobi to do study and exchange uh, of peer-to-peer -peer interactions. So that is a very key sector that is being supported by aviation. Uh, I look at careers that are available in, in aviation. We are looking at aircraft and avionics, equipment, mechanics and technicians. Uh, University of Nairobi has been in the forefront of even uh, providing these courses in aerospace engineering, operations and technicians who are in the aerospace engineering. We are looking at airline pilot, both private and commercial. We are looking at air traffic controllers, the guys who guide us in the skies. Uh, we are looking at aerospace uh, airport operations and flight control. This is another uh, career that can be pursued. Aviation safety inspectors, we are talking about even the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructure. They have this division there. We have Kenya Civil Aviation Authority. We have airport authorities. We have other stakeholders like uh, ICAO, which is the international body that does regulation for for air, airspace and aviation. We have flight instructors. You can be a lecturer in a flight school. You can be a coach in aviation. Uh, we have flight attendants in customer service. We have cleaners and the guys who make sure that you have a safe and a nice place to sit on and uh, enjoy the facilities. Even in an environment where a good uh, friend, Dr. Moses Ikiara said that that is his field, we have uh, environmental management in aviation. As it is, it is being said that aviation is a contributor in pollution because if you look at the kind of uh, energy that you use is uh, a product of petrochemical, which has high content in carbon and, and aviation environment has become an issue in the world, especially in climate change where uh, climate issues are being tackled. Uh, aviation has been put on, on, a, on, a, on a red alert as part of the contributor of carbon emission. So we are looking at all these factors. If you are in into environmental science, environmental management, you still have a space to play in aviation industry in terms of regulation of uh, pollution, management of pollution, energy consumption, use of clean energy and so forth. We are looking at government and political scenario where aeropolitical is a critical area in government, uh, Ministry of Transport, Ministry of, uh, of Energy, uh, Ministry of Infrastructure are critical players in, in uh, this uh, segment of aviation. We are looking at humanitarian aviation. We are looking at medical evacuation. Our friends at AMREF are playing a very critical role. Red Cross, uh, United Nations uh, refugee and humanitarian uh, organizations are involved in aviation, humanitarian aviation industry. We are critical help, medical equipment, uh, medical staff, evacuation of persons where there is a disaster war and human conflict use aviation as part of uh, a facilitation of movement of people, movement of resources, uh, movement of critical uh, 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 resources that are needed at, in, in terms of humanitarian intervention. Uh, last but not least, a look at the qualification that you need uh, to be involved in aviation industry. As a commercial pilot, you need accreditation courses uh, to be uh, given a license. We have Bachelor of Aviation. We have Bachelor of Science in Aviation Technology. We have Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering. We have Bachelor of Aeronautical Science, Bachelor of Science in Air Traffic Management, Bachelor of Science in Aviation Management, Bachelor of Science in Aviation Maintenance, um, Information Technology, Aviation Physics and Space Sciences is an emerging uh, career. Right now, people are talking about aerophysics uh, we are talking about space explorations. We are talking about uh, unmanned equipment being sent into space. We are actually talking about human uh, unmanned equipment being used for human transport. 
where you have uh, aeroplanes of the future will be pilotless. The pilots will just be there to, to, to oversee the operations, but the machine can be able to operate on its own. We're talking about Bachelor of Arts, uh, aeropolitical studies, aviation law, aviation consultancy. In as much as these courses are based in, in uh, have core scientific uh, background, both arts and skills and other uh, courses are still useful. We cannot just say that you have to be a scientist to be able to be involved in aviation. You can still be doing art courses and any other related courses that contribute directly or indirectly to aviation. I look at uh, trends in aviation, you're looking at clean and renewable energy, hybrid combination of uh, carbon-based energy and electric, electric or chemical-based energy, which is the new trend. Uh, aviation is actually looking at how we can reduce pollution by not depending solely on carbon-based uh, energy, like oil and uh, aviation fuel. We are looking at hydrogen, we are looking at uh, electricity and other uh, materials that can be used and minerals that can be used to to emit energy that can be useful in aviation because aviation uses a lot of energy uh, in all, all sectors from the ground to the sky we consume a lot of energy actually energy contributes to more than 40 percent of our expenditure so we are looking at uh, also space technology exploration of outer limits there's uh, currently uh, equipment being sent to space. Many countries are launching their own spacecraft to recently we look at the United Arab Emirates. They launched a space uh, equipment to explore space. Sorry for that. Uh, we're having a power side, but it will come back. Uh, we need to go. We have uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, what we call Internet of Things, is a new uh, phase of aviation. In the 21st century going to the 22nd century, you might find that a lot of uh, artificial intelligence is being involved in aviation industry. So those who are studying or who are looking forward to do uh, or venture into artificial intelligence, you will find your space in aviation industry. Right now, aviation is using a lot of technology like robotics and program processes where there's contact-free services and automation. You might go to the airport and you don't find someone to greet you. You just enter your details into the screen. Uh, a robot will take you through the processes. This is already happening in Japan. This is already happening in Dubai and, and, and Doha, uh, where Qatar is, is, uh, is being hosted in Europe and many other countries. You might not even meet your luggage until you, you get to your final destination. And you're wondering, where is your bag? Uh, you find it in the US. So these technologies where robotics and program processes are being used is also an area that you can explore. Yes, uh, two, two more minutes. minutes. Yes, I'm, I'm done, I'm done, uh, doctor. Material science is also part of the thing that you can do. So I'll just conclude there. Uh, hopefully you have garnered a few things that you can do and I'll be open to questions and answers uh, once you're done. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fred and, and Dr. John for inviting us. Thank you, please let us applaud. David, that was excellent. Aviation industry. You know, I keep on wondering, David, Airbus A380, capacity to carry 850 passengers. Yes. Technology will put it up there in the air. And once the pilots have it in the air, the autopilot takes over. Yeah, Young it is men true. and women uh, if... who are listening. If you're part of that, I call it um, magic. Is that not our rewarding career? Absolutely, that absolutely. That will be the air for 13 hours mm -hmm. and land safely and deliver those 850 people. Absolutely. Uh, aviation gives you a very interesting uh, experiences. So we welcome the young guys who want to pass you. That's what I'm this. saying, that uh, it is a rewarding career. Yes. As uh, David has told us, it needs ICT experts. It needs everyone from the ground controllers to those young people like you who are sitting in front of their laptops developing 
new programs for those aircrafts, new programs how to handle cargo, new programs how to handle passengers. Please keep all your questions to the end, David is available so that he'll be able to interact with you. At this juncture, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nicholas Letting to share with us this rewarding careers. David, you have the floor. Sorry, not David, Nicholas. <laughs> Sorry about that. Nicholas Letting, you have the floor, please. Nicholas, are you still with us or you left? Did Nicholas leave us? I'm trying to look for him. Nicholas, if you are with us, please, it's your turn. Yeah, Nicholas is still there. Yes, yes, Fred. Yes, it's your turn. Kindly, you have your 15 minutes. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Fred. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, my colleagues who have uh, presented before me. Uh, thank, you for, uh, th thank you, Moses and uh, David. Mine will be very simple. I am coming from the humanities and the social sciences uh, sector. That is having, having pursued a Bachelor of Commerce degree in the University of Nairobi with various options. You had the option of doing a marketing course or accounting or finance or insurance or human resources. Now, the world of work today for, my, for, the, for the current future uh, leaders is really looking at digital learning, utilization of digital learning to be able to reach out to the customers. At the end of the day, we serve customers. We serve people and organizations who require value for their service, for, your, for the money they are paid. And so for me, from my experience of about over 20, my experience is not like that of uh, Moses and, uh, and John, uh, David, because I think, uh, I completed university about close to 25 years ago. And I have worked in both multinational corporations. I worked, my first employer was BAT. And my second employer was in training institutions at this KIM and then the university and then also now Kasnep as a CEO. Now, from, what, from where I sit and my experience, I can tell the, the current crop of students that um, there's a lot of potential if you are able to pursue a professional qualification while at the university, regardless of what course you are doing, if you are in engineer, studying engineering or medicine or social sciences, you actually require to be able to pursue an additional course, for example, CPA or CPS or even project management. Most engineers require a course in uh, project management, for example, and I'm sure some of you are doing that course can consider that. Even those ones who are doing agriculture like uh, Moses did, currently you need to know, understand everything we do now is a project. So you need some additional knowledge. I will use my experience. When I was doing my BCom, I, I specialized in marketing option. And uh, there are those of us who specialize in accounting. But I opted to also, in addition to my BCom, I opted to do CPA. And I remember this time when we were looking for jobs after university. And there was this time when we went for an interview with BAT, it was what is called management trainee options. And one of the things that stood out for me was this additional qualification about from the academic that I had. And I had these guys who had become accounting. In fact, we had, had performed very well. But me, I had become marketing, but still uh, divided them in the, in the game. I remember four of us were employed out of over 300 applicants who had applied for that position. Fast forward later on, I also got more advantage and promotions within the organization because of that. So in terms of future careers, rewarding future careers, I see where you need to know how to identify your hobby. Choose what you like to do. You must enjoy what you shall, will be doing. In fact, people who have identified their hobbies and passions have been able to succeed. 
I may not have a presentation, but I want to share my experience from the bottom of my heart because I have a lot of respect and and, and I love the University of Nairobi where I've been mentored and brought up uh, for the last almost uh, 25 years or, or 30 years because I joined in 1993. Now, from where I sit as an employer now, I look at options, people pursuing business courses, even if they're doing something else. I've seen doctors come and do MBA, for example. I've seen engineers do MBA or accounting or something like that because at the end of the day, we are responsible for resource management. Even if you are a medic, if you're in a, you are an agronomist, you are responsible for managing resources. Resources can be finances, resources can be people, mainly. And now to facilitate that, you need to understand how to communicate. Indeed, the current, the government of Kenya is uh, undertaking a process called competence-based curriculum, which is affecting the, the basic education subsector of education. The universe subsector will be transformed in the, next, in the next few years. One of the expectations of the competence-based curriculum is that the people of the future will have to have about seven uh, values, seven uh, characteristics. One of them, and I'll concentrate on about three or so, is about communication. How are you able to communicate with the people that you deal with? The other thing that the pillar that the uh, competence-based curriculum, because I've had an opportunity to work as a council member, though to be as a council member at the Kenya Institute of Curriculum where this process is happening, is a good citizenship. How can you be a good citizen for our country? How can you be a patriot? I normally advise, admire our athletes, athletes when they go running abroad. And they start moment when we are all united behind our athletes, especially the long, the long, long, long distance marathoners. You look, everybody is holding their breath to wait for them to win. So I look forward with the, the future of, of our, our future rewarding opportunities. When you, when you are doing something at, with an intention of being patriotic to your country, it, it doesn't matter where you come from in Kenya, but what you want to do now is to be, I've met, I've had an opportunity and a privilege to travel globally. And you meet Kenyans, they are working together regardless of where, which part of Kenya they come from. I've been to Rwanda. The, the economy of Rwanda is driven by Kenyans in the ICT and business sector. I've been to the South Africa, I've been to Australia, I've been to UK, I've been to Brazil. And you find a few places that we find Kenyans, they are actually running the show there. And in Australia, for example, there's this very qualified accountant who is running a business of gold. I think he was calling it Blue Diamond, a very serious Kenyan. Who is an accountant? Who is a become holder? And so he's running the show. He's able to acquire precious metals, gold, diamonds, actually. And then he's able to uh, preserve them, find a way of selling them to people. They are a very good price. So there's a lot of opportunity in business, self-employment. You know, like Moses and uh, David said, John, I think the future is about not to be employed, I've actually noticed that the current generation of young people do not want long-term employment. They no longer want that, that aspect of having to wait to get a pension. They go for a short-term contract, maybe three years, five years, even one year sometimes. And they're able to deliver. They're able to go forward to ensure that they're able to serve the customers in a fast manner and get rewarded for it. So the future rewarding career is because we are, that's what you are discussing. I see digital programs, ICT related or business related, but ICD, look at m -Pesa, for example, it's creating a lot of employment. It's a technology enabled business opportunity. So I challenge the future generation of our young people that even though you may be pursuing a course that you might have wanted, you might have wanted to do. Yesterday I had an opportunity in the office to meet a young lady who is pursuing something in geospatial engineering and something, something like that. And as she said, that's my passion. She wants to be a surveyor. That's a good thing. But at the end of the day, it is good to know that the employment market is shrinking. The issue of creating a uh, value, value creation, so that the customer that you are serving, and the customer can be everywhere. It doesn't have to be a local past customer. I have had people, young people who are currently uh, employed to serve online. And that is technology. So the future career, career is are in technology. So you can do 
ICT related courses, you can do business related courses. And as you do that, then you also need to do courses in Kastner. I talked about Kastner because it has been around for the last 51 years. It has offered training for accountants, examination for accountants. And these accountants are, are working in every sector, aviation sector, agriculture, you know, transport sector, medical sector, health, all of them, faculty. You know, universities require people who can drive businesses in form of accountants, business advisors, and all of them. To my mind, the future rewarding careers is, are those which in, require you to relate with other people. And as you, one of the things that I've said earlier on is communication, interpersonal communication. I've had this opportunity to employ people, ask them for reports, and they find it difficult. In fact, I was so disappointed in a situation where I had this very qualified person in a PhD, unfortunately, who could not write a report. I asked him myself, why, how did he even do his PhD? So we require people who can do very nice reports with clear recommendations. And reports don't have, don't, don't have to be very long reports. It can be two, three pages, which can actually communicate uh, in, in a manner that customers want to understand what you want. So um, I challenge the, the current group of students in the university that um, if you want to be relevant in the future, continuously develop a relationship with the people, know how to relate with people, know how to work with others around your space, be they your employer, be they your parents, be they the administration of the universities that you operate with, and then be able to know your limits. Because as, even as you work with others, you may require to be able to, uh, to know how to manage expectations of other people around you. Finally, um, we do uh, operate an environment where we examine people in custom. And we do that every three, three sittings. We do and uh, have a sitting in April, we have a sitting in August, and we have a sitting in, uh, in December. So I would like to challenge them to you consider doing that because it gives you an advantage, particularly for those who want to pursue a career in, uh, in, uh, a career in, um, in areas of uh, accountancy, investments, corporate secretarial, company governance, good, good governance, among, among, among other areas. So my, my advice to the future generation of leaders is to have an open mind, you know, work of a, a situation where you do a lot of research. Before you go for a job you have applied for, you need to undertake a lot of background check about the, the, the employer, the potential employer that you are looking for. Because you know sometimes an employer can ask you, what do you know about this organization? And you don't seem to know about it. And why do you want to work with an institution that you don't know about it? What is their mandate? What is the expectation of the employer? So if you choose to be an employee, it is very, very important that you get into understanding more. So basics like researching, uh, surveying, uh, analyzing things, you learn them through experience. And more important also, you look for mentors. You know, there are so many mentors in the industry. Personally, I have about five or so mentors, different people. Somebody in a, a CEO, I've been a CEO for now 10 years, but I still have other mentors above me, people with more experience than me. I have professors, very old professors who are my mentors. They share my, their experiences with me. And there's an African saying that says, what a young man can see standing on a tree may not be the what an old man can see even while seated. I think it's an African saying. So when you encourage young people that you then acquire yourself coaches and mentors who can be able to and understand how who can share the experience and challenges they have got. We are now take advantage of COVID. Even as we fear and we complain about COVID, there are many people who are making businesses out of COVID. And as a genuine business, you know, opportunities even to develop programs, for example, on say visitors coming to an institution who do not have using biometric means, maybe your eyes, maybe your fingers well sanitized fingers. You can actually have a system where somebody, uh, they can come in there, they clock they lock in, and you get, you, you get your pay for it. And many young people are doing that. So I encourage the young people to consider such opportunities and explore them. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Fred, sorry. And I've enjoyed myself, yeah. So let me, I'm looking forward to uh, questions, to question time, so that you can be able to share our experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let us applaud, Nicholas. I think it's been a great morning. It's been really exciting morning. 
We started with Moses, somebody who learned agriculture, has walked the road and is back to the farm now. Then we have had David, a gentleman who is involved in putting over a thousand people in the air and taking them from city to city, from Kisumu to Nairobi, and land them safely. Nicholas has just shared with us his experiences. A become graduate and now a CEO examining people. And what we take from Nicholas is that communication, communication is given an example of a PhD holder who cannot communicate. So if you cannot communicate, it does not matter how many papers you have, but nobody will touch you. And let me say, even if you have good product, you cannot sell it. So as Moses had said, you will not have money in your pocket. Nicholas has told us about being a good citizen. Those relationships matter as you choose your career. And lastly, I think what more important and which I share with him, it does not matter at what stage in your life you are in, have a mentor, have a coach. It will not matter how old you are, how successful you are in your profession, but I think it cannot, we cannot emphasize, especially for the young people, mentors and coaches will hold your hand and make you enjoy that Moses told us what you have chosen to do. Uh, just go through the, the messages. We have uh, Musioki, who has told us that he's enjoying what he's doing and we thank you. He did project planning and is now doing farming and is saying he's paying. So Musioki, maybe I'll look for you, buy me coffee. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for your comments. Our panelists are available. Let me start by the questions which have been posted to Dr. Kiara, John already posted, what advice would you give students who think that agriculture and veterinary sciences are not a rewarding career? Thank you, thank you, um, Fred, for moderating very well. Actually, I was busy, I was multitasking, I was responding uh, as uh, my colleagues were presenting, but I can, uh, but I can say, so what I, I responded to John, that um, it, is, it is a myth, it is a myth. There are amazing opportunities in agriculture and events. We just need to be innovative and think out of the box. I, I give an example of um, people who can get good uh, vet doctors. They are losing their animals because the people who are there are, 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 are quacks. If I can use that one, they have not been, uh, you know, really, really well, uh, well trained. Uh, then I said, uh, if you look at uh, even small companies, people, I, I saw, I look at, I follow Twitter and all that, and uh, I have been seeing cases of people, even teachers and uh, people who are lawyers, who are saying they have been amazed uh, the opportunities in agriculture, even going by the roadside during COVID, parking their vehicles and selling produce from the boots. They have realized they are making uh, uh, much more money uh, than um, uh, than even what they are making from the other profession. Uh, I'm also told of, uh, um, you know, I think there are some, you know, you know, people like uh, top lawyers like Philip Murugol and others who we know are very, you know, and you know, legal law, uh, law as a top lawyer. But actually, they do simple math and they say if you produce a few eggs, and you scale up, produce enough, not just be ready to only produce 10 or 20 eggs uh, per week, and you think you're you are in business. You sell in that sense, that actually there's no nothing else that can beat the money you get from there. That's why Bidco Africa is going into juices and other areas. They are not going to any complicated thing. Uh, Coca-Cola Africa, they are also staying in the sector. 
look at the um, uh, this uh, trigger firms who have innovated, and all they are doing is uh, to make sure the, the 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 bananas that friend you produce and you are wondering where to sell, and me I'm looking for bananas to buy that actually both of us connect through through a simple innovation in technology. We can do it, it's a, it's a lot. People just need to say, like, you know, if they have vets who are listening to, to us, it, there's a big uh, vacuum waiting. People just need to get together, write good proposals. I've indicated somewhere else that, uh, because people say, I know somebody might ask me, how can I invest where will I get capital, you know? On the other side, we hear from a youth fund and uh, all these other ways of fund. The money there, people are not taking. Why? Because people are not writing good business, uh, business plans. Uh, so I think this is where Fred also, like at the university level, we have to tweak the training a little bit to give the students very practical. So the, the examination becomes like uh, writing a good business plan. Uh, leave all the other theories, you just bring a plan and you even, uh, you know, something that the funders can, uh, can work with, uh, can, can, can use to, to fund. So I think those who think there are opportunities in agriculture or vet sectors, it's a myth. There are a lot of opportunities. Me, I've, uh, I've promoted Kenya in all over Japan, UK, America, everywhere. Uh, I have invested in real estate, I've done many other things, but now I think where the action is, is in agriculture. It's agriculture. Thank you. I yeah. think young people are listening to Moses. And with actually COVID, it showed us that agriculture is where the fulfillment and where the money is. We have Edwin Okore, and he's asking for someone who has completed CPA and willing to enroll for BCom accounts. What are the opportunities to explore if one wants to offer consultancy services? I think this I'll, I'll open both to Nicholas, uh, maybe to David, to, to react to what uh, Edwin is asking. Nicholas? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fred. Yes, to just advise uh, my brother, it's about how do you distinguish yourself from other people? Because in the market, there are so many sellers of their services. So one of the things that I just want just to emphasize is being able to offer your services, even at, um, as a volunteer at some occasions, until people know you. I have this, I'll share some experience. Some, there's this lady who got a first class honors degree in economics from the University of Nairobi. And she had all those, she had all those, she had also done CPA and she had completed. So one time when I was in, uh, in the university, management university of Africa, she just came because she had looked for a job and she didn't get. She was looking for attachments, internship, she didn't get. What she did then was to come and courageously come and tell, uh, tell me, CEO, VC, I would like to, to, to volunteer in this institution. And even, even if it's necessary, I think the father would even pay for internship because she thought then that's the only way she can earn some experience. I said, this is a very interesting case. So I told the lady, come over. I spoke to our HR office. She was interviewed that she was among the best. So she was selected in to come as an intern, but now this time she was not paying us. She was, we were paying a small stipend. Let me, know, let me inform you that now, five years down the road, this girl is one of the best employees in the institution because she fitted into the system. She understood, she learned very fast, being a first class student who got a, a BA economics for the University of Nairobi. And also CPA, she had finalized CPA within a short time when she was in the university. So she's running, she, she's, she's a very fast growing person in, in accounts and finance department of, the, of that institution, which I've left since. So that's a very good example. For, for Edwin, I think the best, thing, the best thing is then be able, if you have done CPA, you want to pursue a big company, that's the best option. Just go, go ahead. We have institutions that, uh, I know our university has not yet uh, accepted this. There are institutions that have allowed somebody with CPA to go and to proceed with the recall. If they don't have a degree already, they can pursue a degree, a BCom in year three, year two. I know I don't want to say other universities because today we are in a university of Nairobi, but there are two or so of them. So, so what they do is that uh, you can pursue, and because Kenya National Qualification Authority has given 
have, have classified CPA as level six in the levels of careers and, and qualifications. So I would, I would encourage uh, Edwin and others that they can go and uh, register and do a BCom accounting option or any other option and go ahead to be employed whatever they want. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicholas. And again, John Orindi is a very busy man, is asking, what qualification should a young, young people or a young man have to, uh, have to, to get jobs outside the country? I, I believe that's what John, you wanted to ask, not to attack. Jobs cannot be attacked, sorry, John, it's, it's to attract jobs outside the country. Maybe, um, David, you might be in a better position. You're the one who is flying people all over the world. What qualification should a young man have to attract jobs outside the country? Um, actually, if, if uh, any qualification will do, I'm, I'm not saying that there is a specific, but the good way to approach it is to look at what is the current trend in the global economic uh, environment. I can tell you that right now, food and water is a very critical thing. Actually, you'll be surprised that in the 22nd century, as we go into it, water crisis is one of the critical issues that, that is affecting the world today. Yeah. And food. Uh, just during COVID, you understand that the demand for food has skyrocketed. Actually, it has tripled. So the people who are involved in agriculture and agriculture added value, agriculture technology, right now you can actually farm without having land and soil. We are looking at aquaponics and all these other technologies that are there. So number one, food and water is going to be a very key thing, followed by technology. Right now technology, uh, we're calling machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, programmed processes, a mobile phone, will be the future office. If you're having a phone and you're connected, you can actually access everything. Payment systems, processes, communication will be reduced to a very small gadget. So technology is going to be key. And human services. You find that now even issues like coaching, mentoring, uh, uh, medical uh, consultancy, Someone doesn't need to go to the hospital to see a doctor. You can call a doctor, they can give you a prescription. You can scan the area that you are having an issue and send as a photo. All of these things, uh, the, the careers that touch on human element is going to be very lucrative, or even internationally. Teachers, nurses, you find that uh, just uh, the other day, countries like Europe, Italy, were asking for nurses from Africa. If you're a nurse, you can get a job in Italy during the COVID time. So those are the kind of uh, careers that can, can actually give you uh, an exposure outside there. But as a matter of principle, I can say that so long as you have the right skills and you have the right attitude and you hardworking and focused, you can get a job anywhere in the world. I mean, uh, even you can just be, you can be a teacher, you can be a plumber, and you can get a job in Europe, depending on your focus and your, your, your determination to do that. So I'm saying, just look at the current trends, always develop a skill. Don't just uh, get the papers in terms of uh, education. You have a degree, you have masters. What skills do you have? Uh, what other abilities do you have and talent? And those areas can help you to build on what you have and you'll be marketable outside there. Thank you, Dr. John. And thank you, thank you. I think now we will open the floor to anyone who would like to ask a question. Please raise your hand so that I can see and I give you a chance to do the direct uh, interaction with our panelists. Uh, do we have anyone? Fred. Fred. Yes, John? Uh, this is uh, Dr. Latin. Nicola. Yes, Nicholas. Yes, just to add on to what David has said, the, for, I, I know that whatever somebody is doing that relates on food, because we, food is a basic need, and also human relations. And I just want to emphasize what David has told us, because if you notice that um, 
somebody who's dealing with food, maybe be it as a very good food preparer, you know, something like that. So agriculture, food uh, science will be good. Anything dealing with people relationship, mental issues, you know, we have challenges, psychologists. Those are the future, from where I see, those are the future people who can be able to relate with, talking to people about the future, how to handle challenges in families, challenges in life, careers, and all that. So psychologists, nurses, doctors, medics will be having a future, a very good future. Of course, not forgetting the social scientists will be able to organize, organize people in terms of their options that they have to do in their lives. So I, I would encourage young people to also have multi, multiplicity of skills if they can and pursue their options. I just give an example, another one, before I, 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 I allow, I, I leave for this, this meeting. Um, there was, during COVID, there was this person who had visited a, a cousin somewhere. And the cousin is a very connected person. So she told her, can you make some chapati for us? She did, she did some chapatis uh, in the house. And then the, the, the cousin who was uh, working in a, as a chama, she said, ah, this chapati is nice. Maybe I can share with some of my members uh, in one of the meetings which I'll be having the chama soon. So I can tell you, the lady did a chapati. She, did, she had lost her job. She was employed somewhere. And then she did her chapatis. And then in the process of making Japanese, she did Japanese for the chama of the cousin, whom she was staying with for a short time. And the kind of order she received immediately after that for uh, making Japanese for the other people. Some people are really lazy, they don't want to cook for themselves. The lady has been so busy looking doing Japanese that to the extent that now she no longer interested in looking for a job, but just doing Japanese for, her, for people for orders and the orders are so much that you cannot satisfy. So those are examples of somebody, what can somebody can do? Thank you so much, Fred. I think uh, you I just tell Fred, Fred, uh, if I, Fred, yes, if I also, I, this is an interest, is a very good question. I also want to intervene briefly. Um, I don't know if uh, everybody knows right now as an economy, we have a shortage of uh, technical skills. What do I mean? So machine operators, name any type of machines, whether you say printing machines or whatever, whatever. Uh, people are suffering, they can't get people with those technical skills. To get good plumbers is a, is a challenge. To get good carpenters is a challenge. In fact, one of the limits, one of the limitations uh, in the film industry, that has uh, affected Kenya or constrained the growth of uh, you know, film industry in Kenya is because they are not good enough carpenters, carpenters in large numbers that can be able to quickly set up uh, film scenes. So I think some of the destinations have uh, uh, they outcompete us because of that. You've heard about the, the one famous engineer who is an expert on uh, pipeline, pipeline uh, uh, engineering or welding even welding, and we hear it's now somebody very, very old, you know? So they, I think the country may have, have almost no one. Good masons and all that. We are actually now encouraging uh, um, even foreign investors to come and uh, uh, build high quality technical institutes to compete with the ones that are here and, and, uh, and give these uh, skills. Those of you may also have seen in social media about uh, two people who are classmates. One was a smarter one who went to do engineering. The other one was a bit average, went and dropped out to do technical uh, studies. Then they, they met up after some, maybe a decade or two after they are finished and they are finished school. I can tell you the engineer was working, I think in a, uh, in, in a very middle level kind of job, but the other guy could not cope with the demand. He was, flying all of Africa and around the world, doing taking quarter the area is specialized in. So what I would like to say to, to, to I think a key message you need to tell the young professionals who are here. Even if you have whatever de degree, just get out of the, eh, you used to call it the ivory tower. And they say the, the, the degree is very good, it gives you the knowledge, but learn a skill, get people with other skills, and work together to actually uh, uh, even get these jobs out of the country. Thank you.
I just wanted to emphasize the David had mentioned then, please. Thank you, thank you, Moses. Thank you, David. Thank you, Nicholas. Professor Ayub Gitao, you are with us. What can you add to what the panelists have said? Are you get Professor Ayub Gitao? Gitao? I think I've caught him off guard. Uh, I'm opening the floor to members to give the contribution. We have had uh, people who had uh, written something. Those ones have been re um, reacted to. Uh, Ngeso Peter, is there something maybe you want to ask a concern to be cleared for you? I have a question. Uh, my name is Musioki. Uh, yes, Musioki Benjamin. Yes, my, yeah, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, uh, I'm, I'm a student, advanced student at the University of Nairobi. And uh, I, I want to ask my question to Professor Ikiara, or doctor. I'm also um, that uh, is in agriculture. And uh, my question uh, is, uh, is a CEO of uh, an organization that is bringing in people for investment. And we are aware that food security is a big issue uh, globally. I say so, I have data from World Food Program which says that there are around 830 million who are going without food globally. In, uh, United Nations SDG number two, uh, advocates that by the year 2030, we should have zero uh, angry people going. In Kenya or East Africa, or let's say uh, South of Sahara or the whole of Africa, we have around 630 or so who are going without food. Uh, my question is, as, as, a, as a, a leader of, of this country and as also a, a key a panelist and who is involved in ag agriculture, what, what is a country geared to, to addressing the issue? More so that we are into towers or we are talking of white collar jobs and the youth are not actually involved in a lot of agricultural uh, products and where the business is. What are we doing to pull them to that kind of direction? Thank you. Moses, this was directed to you. Yeah, um, thank you, Mosioki and a friend uh, for this opportunity. And uh, this is a very, very good question. Uh, first of all, uh, we're in a situation where if you look at Vision 2030, you look at the big four agenda, even the previous uh, policies, the focus on agriculture from, uh, from the government is, is, very, is, is there. Of course, one may, may say, ah, if it is there, how come we have not reached the Africa level uh, agreement to, to, to reach at least 10% of GDP going to agriculture or something? But the focus is there. If you combine the amount of money going to maybe uh, supporting infrastructure, going to water and all that, and this is supposed to boost uh, agriculture, you would actually find that uh, quite a lot of resources have been allocated there. Now, the problem we have is that uh, we, we, we have a very atomistic uh, system. Atomistic in the sense that you find pockets of people who are doing their, their thing and they are doing it very well, but they are small and uh, you don't see the, um, uh, you know, that the scaling up is of a challenge. So I think what is required in the, in the country and I think we are slowly getting there is what I also mentioned in my, in my presentation earlier on, that we must always take a value chain approach if you take a value chain approach, it will open up a lot of opportunities, even for small players. They have a way of plugging in, you know, so that rather than being uh, atomistic, the value chain approach is going to order and organize so that we can have scale up and everybody can fit in. What do I mean by value chain? Take the example of um, uh, 
I think I'll take maybe the example of avocado, which is uh, very, very hot in the market at the moment. Uh, a value chain starts with looking at the market. You say, which, where can we get strong market for avocado that we know is not going to change quickly, like what happened to Dengu. You remember Dengu a few years ago, uh, Governor Chari Tengiru and my governor in Meru County, they, they gave you the farmers seeds <coughs> to grow green grams. And when they produced the market in, in, in India, which was supposed to be the main market, it collapsed. They happened, India happened to have also had a bump harvest of green grams that year. And you know the problem that we, 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 we got. So we needed to have a strong market, not rely on one country, have a very strong market, and then say, what does the market require? How do they want our avocado to be looking like? What kind of product? Then with that aspect of the market, you actually build the capacity of all the farmers, producers, make sure the, 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 seed, the seedlings that are supplied of what it takes to meet those specs. Make sure the extension support that is provided is helping them to meet those specs. So if you organize with somebody coordinating the value chain, who should be primarily be the, the, the processor and to, to be incentivized to now coordinate the value chain very well, it will work. And you'll find now a situation where a small farmer who is having a maybe 10 avocado trees is able to get good money out of that because the market, every, the value chain is nicely coordinated. So I think that's what I can say. It's just to say, as a country, every year, let's focus on two, three value chains. We say, let's streamline them, make sure there's an effective coordinator of this value chain, make sure the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Trade, they have negotiated good access markets and locked them through agreements. That way we can actually, and then of course, take care of inputs and including water. Water is a, is a major issue like, uh, I think like, uh, is it David uh, who talked about water? It's, it's a big, big issue. And we have to, I'm looking forward to seeing the way we are seeing focus on rules. We need to see similar focus on water now because we are a water scarce country and it's a key input into, into agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Moses. Uh, Kennedy Wanjala is asking, I'm an undergraduate student of BSc Industrial Chemistry. Panelists, how is my future in this field? I don't know who will take that. I don't know whether it is uh, Nicholas or David who would like to, 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 to give a response to Kennedy. Or even Moses. David, you want to go first? Okay, um, maybe Moses okay. You can go first. Then I'll I'll have something to add. But uh, you know, I wanted the panelists to respond I... to this. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Fred. Maybe I can go first. This is uh, Dr. Nicholas Matin. Yes, is that uh, okay. Please go first. Yes. Fine. Kennedy, you are doing bio, uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. In the, he's doing industrial very chemistry. Wide, industrial chemistry, sorry. So yes. he has a very wide area of uh, opportunities to grow. For example, a number of uh, manufacturing companies are looking for such individuals. And I'll give you examples. For example, there are manufacturers of food in, um, in, this, in this country. And one of, I'll give an example of a particular friend of mine who also did a similar course many years ago. And what he did was he went to, to that time the opportunity of being a, a teacher. So he taught in a school just to gain some experience and a bit of confidence in his work. And then later on, he became a chemist. He, he worked in a manufacturing on an institution. We later on, worked with Kenya, Kenya Bureau of Standards. And, uh, and along the way, he decided to veer in into area of value chain, supply chain issues, what Moses is, uh, Dr. Moses is telling us. And um, as we speak today, he's an international supply chain uh, director in a leading multinational organization. So manufacturing companies require chemists, industrial chemists to guide them in some of the things that they do. For example, those of manufacturing food like Bitco, like uh, EMBL, like 
BAT, Unilever, the former Unilever, or currently Unilever, among many other manufacturers. So for you, Kennedy, the opportunities are so much. All you need to do is uh, participate in activities that deal with science developments. Like for example, attending, um, even when you're still a student, attending a fora organized by say, the Science Week. Go and do something, well, make a presentation, a project that somebody will identify you. You cannot just say I have a degree and I'm looking for a job. So you need to do something, try to apply the knowledge already acquired from the degree by participating in those projects. And even in the high school activities that they do, where they present very nice science projects, you can identify an area in industrial chemistry, for example, issues to do with management of waste, for example. You know, there are so many waste that come from industries. You can focus on that area and find a solution to that using technology, using the knowledge that you already acquired from the University of Nairobi. And I can assure you that you'll, not, you'll get so many employers looking to employ you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I think uh, uh, I'll go to the next question. Uh, the next question will from a young man, Robinson Kipruto. Is there a future for people pursuing education? I believe their uh, education as, uh, in, at the university. What is the best course after a degree in education? Uh, Moses, I think uh, you, you should be able to tackle that. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, would, I would say actually the, this degree in education is uh, similar to agriculture in terms of a, a very good foundation and the versatility in terms of uh, what else you can do. Um, and, and people are doing very well. You know, I've seen people even uh, who do, uh, uh, of course, before tuition was, uh, was discouraged as maybe giving a lot of children a lot of uh, pressure. Yeah, people who are making uh, lots of good money combining their normal teaching work with uh, giving a uh, tuition to, to, to people who are able to pay and, the, and you can make actually a good money out of that. More, uh, we've also seen people who, have, uh, who are in education and have invested. Education has been one of the best sectors to invest in. Uh, you find even people who are, who are elsewhere, they, they, they invest in education because the returns to education quite high. Except now, of course, during the COVID shock the system where uh, people now could not go to school for some time and many of the institutions uh, uh, suffered. So, uh, but COVID will not be there forever. Uh, so the education sector is still a, a good place where somebody can invest and build a, a, an institution, institu uh, uh, schools that give value for money, good quality, at a competitive price. That would be, it's, it's, a, it's a sector that I even thought of uh, investing in myself at, uh, at, at some point because education is so, so important. But besides that, education uh, gives you skills to do almost anything. You can, you can uh, find an additional specialization that you can end up to your education foundation and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and really uh, sell your services in the market. You can also use that education you have uh, to go into enterprise uh, in, in, uh, in, in different areas. So for me, I would say education is very good. It's a versatile, it's a matter of just saying, uh, now that I have education, degree education, what is my passion? What do I want to do? What makes me happy? Start from there, and everything else will, 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 will fall into, into space. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. I think, uh, Caroline, we have heard your sentiments, and thank, and, and, and thank you very much uh, for really encouraging people and telling us that uh, this webinar has been a turning point for most of you. And as a University of Nairobi, you know, this is, has been a very exciting topic. We can spend two days talking about them, but time is not on our side. We had slotted for two hours. We are coming towards the tail end of our two hours. I'd really like to thank our panelists, uh, David um, from uh, Qatar, Mo Dr. Moses and uh, Dr. Nicholas for your time and being able to talk to the young people, being able to talk to parents and being able to talk to stakeholders. You have given us what to take home. And I'm sure people have been in this webinar 
they have taken something home and their lives are going to change forever. And they'll remember this day uh, and what has happened. At this juncture, I'd like to request that I know so many things, this webinar can go on and on, but with your permission and uh, with grace of God, please post those questions that you have. We will forward them to the panelists and we'll get back to you through the um, social media platform so that we, we answer you. At this juncture, I'd like to call upon our Corporate Affairs Director, Mr. John Orindi, to give us a vote of thanks and uh, where and tell us that they have, in the afternoon, we still have another exciting webinar. It's starting at two o'clock and I'm inviting everyone to join us. John Orindi. Oh, thank you, Fred, for uh, that wonderful job you've done here with your very good panelists. Uh, I want to take this time to thank Dr. Moses Ikiara, David and Nicholas for agreeing to uh, facilitate this very important uh, uh, career talk. We have organized this so that uh, our future uh, students and also our current students can benefit and have uh, and hear how the market looks like and also to uh, have opportunity to uh, acquire skills that are necessary so that they can be able to be successful. We'll continue to organize such kind of forums uh, with you and uh, so that we can have it's a very good mentorship opportunity. Uh, I want to thank you all for your wonderful contributions. We, in fact, gave you a very short notice, but you've exceeded our expectations. Uh, we look forward to inviting you again in future and welcome again. And we have more opportunities for partnership, even with you in terms of our centers of partners. There's a lot that we can do together. Uh, so that we can have more uh, uh, better graduates who are very competent and uh, able to uh, navigate through the uh, work uh, industry and also be able to co be more competitive uh, across the globe. That's what we are looking for, so that we can have good graduates that can sell Kenya, not only here, but also abroad. So I want to thank you all. I also want to thank our online audience for being with us. Uh, we'll share this uh, on. Uh, uh, online platforms so that we can continue with the conversations. So please uh, continue asking questions and uh, you'll still get more uh, uh, more replies and more information from other stakeholders who are here with us and also will be with us online. Thank you very much, Fred. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, John and everybody. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, John, Fred, David, Moses, and, uh, and even the participants in today's session. I have enjoyed the session with you, the questions, and we look forward to partnering with the University of Nairobi in the future. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a, a good uh, afternoon. Thank you, Fred and the members of the panelists.